And once again, good morning. Can I uh, have you turn with me in your Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 4. Once you find John 4, just put your finger in there and look up here for a minute. There uh, are certain drives that God has built into the human body to ensure its health and survival. One of the strongest of these is the water drive because water is so essential for life. We can only last a few days without it before we die. In fact, water is so vital to our body that only a 5% uh, loss of body water will begin to cause our bodies to not be able to function properly. A 10% loss of body water will cause mental deterioration and a 20 to 25 uh, percent loss uh, is fatal. Now, just as God has given us physical drives to keep our bodies healthy, He has also given us emotional drives, which uh, need to be satisfied if we're going to remain emotionally and psychologically healthy. And I believe the greatest of these, or the most, uh, the strongest of these drives, emotionally speaking, is the need for hope. I think what uh, water is to our physical man, hope is to our psychological or inner man. It's vital to our emotional health. You know, the writer of the Proverbs said in Proverbs 13, verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. Or in other words, when we hope for something that's important to us, but it's something that is constantly being uh, moved into the future, like the proverbial can kick down the road, something that never seems to be fulfilled in the present, well, after a while, we become emotionally unhealthy in our hearts. What does that look like? Well, we become discouraged, disillusioned, maybe even depressed. It's important and vital uh, on an emotional level that we have hope. Now, without a doubt, the greatest need isn't physical or emotional. The greatest need that we have, and many don't realize this, but it's spiritual spiritual. You see, there is a thirst deep within the soul of every person to know and connect with God. I mean, if that wasn't true, we wouldn't see the uh, proliferation of religion around the world. What is religion? But it's simply man reaching out to satisfy his or her thirst to connect with God. The psalmist expressed this when he said in Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. You know, the Bible tells us that God made us with a God-shaped void in our hearts that can only be filled with a relationship with Him, you know, with the true and living God, or more precisely, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so often people are thirsty in their souls for God. But they don't realize what they're thirsty for. They just know there's an emptiness inside. They just know that they're unsatisfied. Uh, that no matter what they do, it doesn't seem to satisfy that longing inside of them. But because they don't realize what they're thirsting for is God himself, they go on trying to fill that void with relationships or material possessions not realizing that only God will fill that void because, as we just said, it is a God-shaped void that he put there that we would seek after him. Now, guys, with all that in mind and with all that is background, we come this morning to John chapter 4 and to the story of a woman who came to a well to satisfy her physical thirst for water only to be made aware of her deeper and most important thirst, her thirst for God. Now let's back it up to chapter twenty, excuse me, chapter three, verse twenty-two, kind of get the context. So in chapter three, verse twenty-two, it says, After these things Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there we remained with them and baptized. Also John Excuse me, now John was also baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. Verse 1 of John 4, Therefore when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that 
Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize, but his disciples did. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. Now, the Pharisees hated Jesus and would have loved nothing more than to get into an ugly confrontation with him publicly uh, in front of his disciples as a way to discredit him and his ministry. But Jesus wouldn't take the bait. Uh, he was way too smart for that. And uh, he knew that his time had not yet come. Now, his time would come eventually, as we're going to see, where he would have to confront the Pharisees. Uh, you can read about that in Matthew 23. Okay, uh, wow, did he let him have it. John 8's pretty good too, by the way. So we'll get to that. But the time was coming when he would have to confront these guys head on, but that time had not come yet. And so rather than to, you know, be provoked into some confrontation with the Pharisees, he decided to leave Judea and go up to Galilee. Now, the Jews in general, and rabbis in particular, like Jesus, who was a rabbi, a teacher, if they had to go from Jerusalem up to the Galilee region, they would never go directly through Samaria. They would usually go east from Jerusalem, cross over the Jordan River, then go north through Perea and Decapolis, and when they were adjacent to Galilee, they would cross back over the Jordan going west and re-enter the land of Israel. Now you can imagine this added quite a bit of time and mileage to their trip. I mean, it would have been much shorter and faster for them to go directly north to Galilee, passing through Samaria. Of course, though, they wouldn't do that. They would never do that. You say, why? Well, it was because of a series of events that happened hundreds of years earlier. I'm going to lay some historical groundwork this morning, but you have to have it if you're going to fully understand John 4. The story goes back about maybe 1,000 years, maybe 900 years to when King Solomon died. Now Solomon, of course, was David's son. He took the throne after his father, David. And then when Solomon died, the kingdom was given over to his son, Rehoboam. Now the people came almost immediately to the young king and said, look, your father really taxed us heavily. And Solomon did. I mean, he used their tax money to build the temple and all kinds of other projects. He uh, had a pension for building a large structures and things and and so on and so the people said look your father really burdened us with a lot of uh, taxes if you will lighten up the load if you'll give us some tax relief we will follow you uh all of our lives and so the young king said well give me a few days to talk it over with my wise guys i'll get back to you let's meet back here in three days i think it was but instead of going to his dad's counselors who were older and wiser you know, young guy, you know, uh, these old people, what do they know? He goes to his young buddies and asks them what he thinks, uh, you, know, they should, you know, what they think he should do. Well, you know, young guys all full of bravado and everything. So they said, look, you got to show them who's boss. You don't let them push you. You got to go out there and talk rough to them. And you got to really show them who's boss. That's the only way to handle these people. So the time came, a few days later, he goes out in front of the people, and he really talks rough to them. And they said, that's it, we are out of here. And so 10 of the tribes of of the north broke away and formed their own kingdom called Israel. The capital was Samaria. And then the two southern tribes, Benjamin and Judah, formed a new kingdom called the kingdom of Judah, Their capital was Jerusalem. Well, the Bible records how the southern kingdom had some good kings, and they had some periods of revival. Whereas the northern kingdom had no good kings, and went from bad to worse spiritually and morally. And after a couple hundred years, and God's very patient, isn't he? After a couple hundred years of sending prophet after prophet to warn them that they didn't repent of their idolatry and immorality, well... God was going to judge them. Well, finally, in 722 B.C., that judgment came. And it came in the form of the Assyrians coming from the north and conquering the land of Israel, removing most of its inhabitants and relocating them throughout the Assyrian 
Empire. They only left a small remnant of Jews in the land of Israel, the northern kingdom. Enough, and they were elderly, handicapped kind of people, uh, just enough to tend the land. And then what they did was they took other peoples that they had conquered in different areas of that part of the world, and they relocated them into the land of Israel, uh, repopulating the land with these foreigners, basically. And um, the strategy was simple and effective. By doing this, you kept the people you've conquered weak and divided. Divided because they were divided ethnically, culturally, and most importantly, linguistically. I mean, if they can't communicate with each other, then they can't come together and organize a revolt. And that way you keep them in a perpetual state of defeat and subjugation. It was brutal, it was cruel, but um, effective. Now, shortly after the Assyrians took all these foreigners and put them in the land of Israel, lions started attacking the population. And so they quickly sent word to the king of Assyria telling him that they, have, they angered the God of the land because they didn't know the proper way to worship him. And so, king, we need you to send one of the priests back uh, from Israel uh, to teach us how to worship this God properly before we all get wiped out. And so the king listened to them, and he sent back a priest who taught the people the proper way to worship the God of Israel. This had uh, as its effect, or the effect of it was to introduce the true and living God to thousands and thousands of foreigners and pagans. Isn't it? You know, we think sometimes that our rebellion thwarts the plans of God. And I'm not saying it's a good thing to rebel against God by any means. I'm just saying God is a lot bigger than us. We think, oh Lord, I blew it. I'll never be able to serve you any Peter, right? Denies the Lord three times, goes out and weeps bitterly. Three days, Jesus is in the grave. Peter's thinking, I, I, it's it, I, it's over. He can never forgive me. He'll never be able to use me. My ministry's done. When Jesus rose from the dead, the first pe person he sought out was Peter. What Peter didn't realize is, his fall didn't disqualify him from ministry. In some ways, it strengthened him because he was putting too much faith and confidence in his own strength. He learned a lesson that Paul would state clearly years later, when I am weak, then I am strong. Our rebellion, our failings, never disqualify us from the work, work of God, if we repent, get our hearts right. But here Israel was definitely uh, in rebellion against God. And God removed them because he promised his people, if you obey me, I'll bless you. If you disobey me and get into idolatry and other things, I'll remove you from this land of blessing. So God was only being faithful to his word. In the process, though, he repopulates the land, allowing the Assyrians to think they're in control. He repopulates the land with a lot of pagans and foreigners and introduces them to, the, to himself. Right? That's going to be important to the story next week. Now, the Jews left in the land eventually married the Gentiles that were brought in to repopulate the northern kingdom of Israel. And the result was a race of people who were a mixture of Jew and Gentile who later became known as the Samaritans. The Samaritans. Now, 115 years after the, after the northern kingdom was captured and taken into captivity by the Assyrians, the southern kingdom of Judah got so bad that they were conquered and carried away into captivity by the Babylonians. They were in captivity for 70 years at the end of which time they were, they were allowed to return to their homeland to rebuild Jerusalem, its walls, and its temple, all of which had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and his armies. As they started to rebuild the Jewish, you know, the walls of Jerusalem and the city and uh, even some of the temple, almost immediately the Samaritans came down and offered to help them. Because after all, we're family. 
We've got Jewish blood in us. We've been worshiping the God of Israel all these years. We feel a strong connection to him. Hey, we're, we want to be a part of this. You know? We're, we're, you know, we're family, you know, and we want to be help with the work. Well, the Jews that returned from Babylon refused their help. You have no part in this, they said. You see, they considered them half-breeds, a defiled race, cut off from the covenant that God made with Moses and Israel because in that covenant they were not supposed to marry foreigners. God was trying to keep the Messianic line pure uh, until Messiah could come. Of course, you know, as John 4 opens up, he's here. Okay. But that was the idea behind God forbidding them to intermarry. All right. So the people come down from Samaria. We want to help. We're excited. We, and we want to help you rebuild the, the temple and the city and the walls and all that stuff. You have no part in this. Get out of here. And, of course, this created a deep animosity between the Samaritans and the Jews living uh, in Judea in general, but in Jerusalem in particular. And so the Samaritans went back to their land, and they built a temple of their own on top of Mount Gerizim near Shechem, which is uh, called Sychar by this time in the New Testament. And they began to worship the God of Israel through, listen, a revised form of Judaism. And through the years, their traditions developed, as traditions do. And one of them claimed that Abraham actually offered Isaac on Mount Gerizim in Samaria, not on Mount Moriah, Calvary, in Jerusalem. Their holy book consisted only of the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy, uh, with a few minor deviations in the Hebrew text, Although they did add one verse to their scriptures, um, a verse specifically mentioning Mount Gerizim as the original site of Solomon's temple, and therefore the only place to worship the true and living God properly. Now, they hang on to that thought. It'll become important uh, as we progress through the chapter. So, you know, Solomon's temple was on Mount Gerizim, and that's the only place to worship God and so on. To this day, guys, the Samaritans still offer animal sacrifices on Mount Gerizim. From what I understand, they uh, strictly observe the Sabbath, celebrate uh, the Passover and the Feast of Yom Kippur every year. That's their holiest day of the year, Day of Atonement. Last time I heard, about 25 years ago I heard this, there was only about 200 Samaritans left. And because they only marry other Samaritans, all the, in all the inbreeding has left most of them in Basilic. So when we read in John 4, uh, as we come to John 4, I should say, remember the background and understand that the deep-seated feelings of animosity and resentment that the Samaritans and Jews had for each other was still very much alive in Jesus' day, so much so that neither would set foot in the other's land. And so understand that as we come to John 4 and we read how that Jesus wanted to go up to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria, understand the only reason I can think of as to why he needed to go through Samaria to get to Galilee, because really, uh, geographically, he could have used uh, two other routes. He could have gone west and taken the coastal ride up to the Galilee. Or, as I said, gone east across the Jordan up through Perea and Decapolis, and then uh, back over into Israel and the Galilee. The only reason I can think of that he had to go through Galilee, or excuse me, go through Samaria to get to Galilee, was because he had an appointment with a woman of Samaria who was thirsty in her soul and needed living water. Again, guys, further understand that this appointment was made before the foundation of the world and had to be kept because God made it. God always keeps his appointments. And that's why Jesus needed to go through Samaria. So our first main point, we'll just call a thirsty soul. Verse 5. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. As we've already pointed out, the name Sychar refers to the ancient city of Shechem. 
And we are told in Genesis 33 that Jacob bought a parcel of land from the descendants of Shechem. So there was a man named Shechem who owned a lot of land in that area. They named the whole area after him. And when Jacob finally comes around, uh, Shechem has uh, one of his sons is Hamor. And Hamor has a lot of kids. And so Jacob actually deals with the sons of Hamor, read Genesis 33, and buys this piece of property from them. It says for a hundred pieces of money. hundred pieces of money. Uh, wait, gold, silver, what kind of money? We're not told. hundred pieces of money, whatever that is. And uh, he buys this piece of land. And in my mind, it seems to have had this well on it already. I don't see anything, and I checked again. I, I, maybe I didn't look in the right place, but I didn't see any place where Jacob and his sons actually dug this well. They might have. But the reason I say that was I went online to see uh, this well. Okay, You can't really go there today. It's a hotbed for you know, violence. So even when you go to Israel, we don't go to Shechem. All right? But I went online. Uh, t- I t- typed, you know, Googled in Jacob's well, right? And I, I, it came up pictures of people jumping into this well of water. I'm thinking, incredible, they actually swim in that thing. Then I looked a little closer, it says Jacob's well in Texas. So, you, so I, don't, I don't think that was the right place. So uh, I said, but Samaria, Jacob's well, Samaria. Okay. So apparently what happens, and, and it's, I, near, I think it's near a, a, an or, unbuilt, unfinished Orthodox church today, um, but from what I was able to read, uh, it, it, from the top of the well, there's a kind of a wall that goes around this well, uh, and, uh, and then from the top of that wall down to the surface of the water is about 30 feet. So you need a bucket and a good amount of rope. That's going to be important to the story as well. And then once you hit the surface of the water, it goes down another 100 feet. It's a deep well fed by a, by a, a spring. All right, um, and, and because of the way it, it's, it, it is, it doesn't look like somebody dug the thing out. It looks like it was already there, um, which would make sense because 100 pieces of silver or gold for a piece of property was kind of substantial back then. And uh, you probably only pay that if you could buy a piece of property with a well on it, uh, a water source, because... In that area, water was scarce, and so any property that contained a river or a spring or some kind of a naturally fed well, that was uh, pretty uh, important. And so I'm thinking that the well was already there. But we learn in John 4 that Jacob eventually gave the well to his son, Jacob. Now, let me just say this to you. The best commentary on the Old Testament is the New Testament. Because the New Testament writers tell us things about events that are not really you know, gone into detail in the Old Testament. Uh, this happens all the time. And one of these little tidbits of information was that Jacob gave this parcel of ground to Joseph. Now, we know from Genesis chapter 50 that as Joseph was, uh, was uh, on his deathbed, he was laying there dying, he made the children of Israel promise him with an oath that after he died... That, you know, he told him, God was, is going to deliver you. God's going to get you out of here eventually. And that was a prophecy. And that God must have spoke to Joseph and told him that. And uh, when the time comes, he said, when God finally gets you out of Egypt, don't leave my bones here. Promise me you're going to take my bones back to the land of our fathers and bury me there. Well, 400 years passes and God raises up Moses And of course, you remember the story how at one point now the ten plagues occur and Moses then is leading the children of Israel out of Egypt, right? In Exodus 13, verse 19, it makes a a point to say, and they took Joseph's bones with them and wound up burying them in the land of Canaan, the land of his fathers. Now, according to ancient tradition, and there are many ancient traditions that, you know, they're not worth anything. Uh, They're so absurd. But I guess from, according to this ancient tradition, this is pretty well attested, that this well was about a half a mile, Jacob's well was about a half a mile south of Sychar. Half a mile south of Sychar. Again, very deep, maybe 100 to 120 feet deep, fed by a spring. So verse 6, Now Jacob's well was there. 
Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. The Jewish day began at 6 a.m., so the sixth hour would put it right at noon, high noon. Now, in that part of the world, as well as in, even in our part of the world, uh, noon is part of the hottest, it starts the hottest part of the day. Noon to three or four is like the hottest part of the day. And if you think it's hot here in Chicago, uh, in the summer from noon to four, you ain't seen nothing until you go on to Israel in a place like Samaria, okay? And even though Jesus, of course, was the omnipotent God, in his humanity, he was still subject to the physical limitations of his human body. And so being wearied, tired, thirsty, you know, from his journey, he sits down by Jacob's well. He doesn't have anything to draw water with, uh, no bucket, no rope, but that's okay. Because he's come up there to meet a person, a woman, to keep a divine appointment, something that was penciled into his docket before the foundation of the world, and he needed to go there. He sits down and waits for his 12 o'clock appointment to show up. So in verse 7, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So they're, you know, in the city getting takeout or falafels and cokes, whatever they were doing. But he's alone, okay? Just him. And now this gal shows up. Guys, the fact that this woman came to draw water alone at noon tells us a few things about her. First of all, it tells us she was an outcast. I mean, the Samaritans were outcasts in general, but she was an outcast among outcasts. That was a tough place to be in. Okay. It's hard to be a group of outcasts, but then you're an outcast among the outcasts. That's rough. In that culture, though, why do I say she was an outcast? Because in that culture, going to the well was really an opportunity for the women. And the women did most of the hard work back then. Okay, the guys, I'm not sure what they were doing. But the women, you know, they, they, they kept busy with a lot of the hard work. And drawing water for the day um, was a time when the gals all went together because they could socialize. We even have a kind of a custom today, don't we? People around the water cooler talking, socializing, okay? I probably got started back there, okay? But the idea is that um, the, the gals would come out, and they would come out early in the morning while it was still cool, not in the heat of the day. And don't forget, they're walking a half a mile in this situation. So, of course, they're going to come out when it's cool, and they come out, and they, you know, they draw the water for the day, and they're talking and fellowship and so on. But the fact that this woman came out to get water and, again, walked a half a mile during the heat of the day by herself at noon during the, as I said, the hottest part of the day indicates that she was a social outcast. Someone the other women didn't want to socialize with, and apparently uh, the feeling was mutual. She didn't want to be around them either. Now, why was she an outcast? Well, as we read the story, we learn that she had been married five times, divorced five times, and now she was just living with a guy out of wedlock. She was probably the town flirt, kind of like the loose, the loose divorcee. And who knows if she had wrecked a couple of marriages in town, and now the women didn't want anything to do with her. They didn't trust her. They didn't want to have any contact with her. And this caused her to have to do these things uh, on her own. And um, I, I think this woman was a broken woman. Uh, I think that she was, um, well, as we're going to see, I think she was without hope. And we'll see why in a second. I, I just think her life was empty, sad. Uh, she had no friends. Um, and that leads me to my third point. I think that this woman was an empty person. I mean, look, none of us Christians would excuse the way she had lived her life. I mean, Jesus certainly wouldn't. Jesus doesn't excuse our sin. But it never gets in the way of him saving us. That's the thing we have to remember. I mean, the Lord never looks the other way when we sin. He never justifies it. Well, they didn't really mean it. Okay, no. He knows what's going on. But it never, our sin never stands in the way of him reaching out to save us. And that was the issue with this woman, all right? Again... Why was she, had she lived her life this way? Why had she been married and divorced five times? Why was she now living with 
uh, a man out of wedlock? I think the answer to that question to me is simple. Because she was thirsty in her soul and didn't realize it, didn't know what she was longing for, she just knew she was empty. She was experiencing a thirst that everybody experiences. She thought, well, the way to satisfy this emptiness or this thirst within me is with a man, is with a man. It's a lot of men uh, and women who are empty inside in our culture who think that they can satisfy that emptiness with a relationship. I know a lot of young people who are just really almost obsessed with the idea of finding someone to marry. Now, guys, that's a good thing. The Bible says he who desires a wife, is that's a good thing. God made us for companionship. He, does, he says it's not good that man should live alone. We, we need each other. But you know what? The devil can always take something good from God, a blessing, and get us to make it into an obsession, an object of worship. And when that happens, what God intended for good now becomes uh, bad, a, st a stumbling block uh, in our relationship with him. But she seems to have been one of these people who thought that, look, I, I need a man to satisfy this emptiness I, I'm experiencing. So look, she meets a guy. She gets excited. Uh, finally, I've met Mr. Wright. I, I, I know that when we get married, it's going to be great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live happily ever after. We're going to ride off into the sunset together. It's going to be wonderful. Of course, that... Marriage didn't last for whatever reason. Now, I'm not blaming it all on her or on him. I think sometimes people like this woman, they're so looking to a person, a relationship, to bring them happiness and fulfillment. They're looking for a human being to fill a void that only God can fill. And it's not fair to the person. If you're, if you're married here today, and you're one of those people that's looking to your husband or your wife to satisfy you. And you've made it your, you know, you kind of made it their responsibility to make you happy. First of all, that's not right and it's not fair. Because no human being can satisfy what's lacking inside of you except the Lord Jesus Christ. My goal is to be the best husband to my wife I can be. To treat her as the best I could possibly treat her. But I know I can't satisfy any emptiness inside of her. That has to be satisfied by God. That's why I encourage her to go to conferences and, and to be around other Christian women and, and so on, because I want her to be filled up with God. Because that, that is doing my best for her. And she does the same for me. We realize we cannot look to each other, as great as our marriage is, we can't look to each other to fill what only God can fill. And so this gal looked at her husband, and the first guy didn't work out, and so she divorced him. And then another guy comes around, and she's excited. Oh, this one's Mr. Right. This, this time, I, this guy is it. And she gets married to this guy, and that doesn't work out. And three more times, she finds a man excited. This is going to be great. I finally found Mr. Right, only to see these relationships crash and burn every time. She becomes so disillusioned now. She gives up on marriage and just moves in with a guy. At this point, I think she's, she's announcing defeat. I mean, she's announcing, that, look, I'm never going to find happiness with a guy. Why even bother getting married? I'll just live with this guy. I mean, at least he's somebody, but I don't, I, I'm, she, I think she was broken, disillusioned. I think she was depressed. She didn't realize it at the time, but she was looking for love and happiness in all the wrong places as the song goes because once again God has put a God-shaped void in all of our hearts he did it purposely because he wanted you and me to eventually seek him to get so tired of the world trying to fill that void with anything the world has to offer that we would eventually start looking for him remember or I should say, Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee.
Today we live in a culture that is empty and desperately trying to fill the, that emptiness with things other than God. I think this is more and more prevalent today because the farther and farther we move away from God as, as a society, the less people look to God uh, to fill any void in their life, if they even believe in God at all. Uh, most of the young people surveyed today don't even believe in God. So they're not going to look to God to fill a void because in their minds he doesn't exist. And so more and more as people are turning away from God, they're looking to the world to fill any emptiness they have inside. And today we see people uh, turning to alcohol and drugs like never before to you know, bring some kind of happiness because they're just empty inside. I think a lot of people in our culture, because we have... Um, you know, we have a lot of resources and we can spend money on, and some people do spend money on luxury vacations, you know. Um, and they can be a lot of fun while you're on the vacation. But you got to come home at one point. And the visa bill comes. That's not so happy. <laughs> okay? Um, material possessions is, of course, a big one. Where people in our culture try to stuff the emptiness with money and materialism and uh, that never works it never works and I think a big one is romance you know internet romance uh, has really escalated um, I can't tell you how many uh, marriages have been destroyed because either the man or the woman went online maybe Facebook connected with an old flame uh, started to talk to them or went into some kind of internet chat room, started talking to somebody. Of course, you know, it's kind of intimate. You're sharing your, you know, your, your hurts and your, you know, and your feelings and emotional bonds are being made. And then finally, that's not enough. You want to meet and, and get to know each other face to face. And then that leads to a physical relationship. I mean, all of these things have reached kind of epidemic proportions in our culture because of the fact that people are empty in their, in their hearts but they don't know how to satisfy the emptiness. Notice what Jesus said to her in verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Now, guys, I don't know if you realize this, but that is an extremely profound statement spoken by the one who made us, the one who knows us, and the one who knows what will satisfy us. And guys, it's a statement that you should write over every desire and ambition in your life, whatever that might be. This morning, have you got some kind of goal? I mean, you've really been going for this goal. It's been a passion. And that's all you can think about is this goal, you know, whatever it might be. And, and, and a lot of times they're very noble goals. I want to get an education. I want to become a doctor or this or that, I mean, wonderful, you know. Um, goals are good if you keep them in perspective. I remember several years ago, the world, I'm not a soccer guy, but the World Cup soccer tournaments were in the States somewhere, and um, Luis Palau, who I think grew up in Argentina, big soccer place, right, was talking about this on the radio. And he was saying, you know, athletics makes a good goal. It makes a lousy God. Take it from somebody who grew up with this. He said, you know what? Goals are good. But not if they become your God. What are the goals you have this morning? What's driving you? Or maybe it's something that you want to acquire. You know, something that you feel like you can just get your hands on that. You know, uh, you know that boat. If I can just get my hands on that boat. I saw one at the boat show and I just thought if I could be in that boat sailing around I'd be the happiest guy in the world that's all I would ever want you can ask some of the people in this room who've had boats two happiest days in a man's life the day he buys his boat and the days he sells his boat <laughs> but you know people think this way if I could only have this or that, or if I could only have him or her, I know I'd be happy. I'd be satisfied. I would never ask for another thing. But, but listen, 
Jesus, the one who made you, is telling you that whatever it is that you have a passion for, right over the top of that thing, drink of this water, but you will thirst again. Drink of this water. Go ahead, drink it, whatever it is, but you will thirst again. Guys, nothing this world has to offer in the way of material possessions or accomplishments or successes or even a human relationship is going to satisfy that deep hunger or thirst in your soul other than Jesus Christ. And and, and let me just tell you this. I mean, because most of you know where I'm coming from because that's where you came from. How many of us in this room could attest to that with firsthand knowledge? Yeah, that was me, man. I I was out there doing stuff and running around and, you know, taking drugs and getting drunk and partying and sleeping with people and, and buying stuff. And I was the most miserable person you ever want to meet. None of it was satisfying me. And yet people still try, don't they? They still try. There's always going to be the when-then person. You ever hear of a when-then person? What is that? When I get this, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be satisfied. But guys, Jesus is here telling us that that is one of the biggest lies Satan has deceived us into believing. It's what Paul the Apostle called the deceitfulness of riches. And it's this. If I just had a little more money, I would be happy. I'd be satisfied, right? Now, of course, most of us never get enough money to buy whatever we want. So we always live with that in the back of our minds. If I could just win the lottery, if if, if old Uncle Ned would kick off, I get that inheritance, I'd be happy. You know, my pastor, Chuck Smith, pastored a megachurch for many years. And because of it, it, a lot of people came into his life. Of course, most of them Christians, but a good number unsaved people, and some of them were wealthy people. And I remember him saying uh, one time years ago that some of the most miserable and unhappy people he ever knew were those who had everything that money could buy. Why is that? Because they had everything. They um, had done it all. There was really nothing left to experience or look forward to. They had maxed out life and nothing had satisfied them or made them happy. You know, years ago, Donald Trump, long before he was ever president, a billionaire, He sat down for a candid interview one time, and he was talking about the emptiness in his life. He said that once you finally acquire what you've been chasing after, and he's a businessman, so, you know, maybe uh, more success, or uh, he was in real estate, so maybe a a property that you were pursuing that, you know, really one of these just incredible uh, properties. Once he said, once you um, acquire what you've been chasing after, It's disappointing. It's a disappointment, he said. It doesn't satisfy. In fact, he said, I've come to realize I love the feeling of just pursuing the deal, pursuing the success. When you finally get it, it leaves you kind of hollow. Well, you know, I remember seeing an interview with quarterback Troy Aikman This is back in 94. Now, Troy Aikman had guided the the Dallas Cowboys, that's what he played for, to -to back-to-back Super Bowl wins in 93 and 94. That's a big deal. If you're an athlete, I mean, you're in football primarily, that is about the biggest deal you can have. Troy Aikman, a quarterback, guided the Dallas Cowboys to -to back-to-back Super Bowl wins 93 and 4. When they interviewed him after the second Super Bowl win, and ask him how he felt about it. Of course, the media thought that you're on top of the world. 
I was shocked to hear Aikman say, I said to my, how do you feel, Troy? Well, I said to myself after I won, is this it? I thought it would satisfy me more. Now, he's saying exactly what we're talking about, isn't he? Should that surprise us? When the creator of the universe, the one who made us, says to us in this chapter, go ahead and drink the water of this well, whatever that thing is, but you will thirst again. I mean, the things of this world do satisfy for a while, don't they? But in the end, it's like eating cotton candy. Sweet to the taste. Get that little rush when the sugar hits your bloodstream. But there's nothing substantive, is there? So you wind up hungry and unsatisfied. That's what the world is offering. A lot of cotton candy that people can eat and eat and eat and maybe even get sick of, but they never get satisfied. And we'll finish looking at Jesus' remedy, which he gets into with this gal next week as we finish this two-part little message I've entitled Living Water. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that in your word you have given us everything that pertains to life and godliness, primarily through the, through the knowledge of our Savior, Jesus Christ. But thank you, Lord, that we don't have to scale the highest mountains, swim the deepest oceans, to find wisdom to know how or what makes life worth living. We have it in your word. Thank you, Lord. It's not a thing. It's a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. We just thank you, Lord, for our Savior. Father, we thank you for giving to us someone who can fill up the empty places, who will never leave us nor forsake us, a person we can finally say, I have found true purpose. I have found the meaning of life. I am satisfied. Thank you, Lord. We ask you to continue to bless these studies in your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Is there anyone here this morning who uh, would like to know more about what it means to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior? Please come on up so we can talk with you. If you need a Bible, we'll give you one. And the rest of you guys, may God give you grace. Understand one thing. We know him. But if we subtly begin to turn away, Solomon knew the Lord. He turned away. And eventually God spent years pursuing earthly things that never satisfied. Read Ecclesiastes. When you begin to sense a, an emptiness inside of you, the answer is not running back to the world. It's returning to your first love. Amen. That's what we need. So may God give us all the grace to understand that. God bless you guys. Have a great week.